The Philippines has already been implementing strategies to improve transparency in domestic climate action and support. These are primarily oriented towards an enabling environment creation and building the institutional capacities of our partners in the national and subnational governments, in academe, civil society, and business and industry, on MRV for adaptation and mitigation programs and projects, and financing. In response to the global call for urgent climate action and transparency, we are preparing the necessary reporting process that would facilitate clarity and transparency. This webinar aims to provide us updates and information on the ETF and the tools and methodologies for our work in sectoral and national reporting. And this is all aimed towards scaling up climate action. The centrality of the transparency framework under the Paris Agreement is now very obvious. We actually refer to transparency as the backbone of the Paris Agreement because it holds everything together. It's now clearly understood after COP26 that uh, transparency plays a crucial role. At COP26 in Glasgow, the final elements of the transparency agreed and Glasgow also saw the conclusion of Article 6, the emissions trading uh, and exchange framework under the Paris Agreement. And that is yet another element that requires a strong accounting framework so that countries are able to participate. Very interesting, surely, for the private sector. My key message is please consider transparency as an opportunity and use the rules of the Enhanced Transparency Framework as guidance with a view to maximizing the benefits of climate action in the Philippines. That will also then benefit the global fight against climate change. The objective of ICAT is to support enhanced transparency to enable evidence-based policy making and implementation for accelerated climate action. We support countries to better assess the impacts of climate policies and actions. We also support them to develop and implement effective climate action, but also to fulfill their transparency commitments. I would also like to highlight in this regard that ICAT puts a lot of emphasis on also supporting national transparency commitments and, and MRV work. So in this regard, it is a combination of international but also national transparency commitment. The Paris Agreement has established this enhanced transparency framework in the Article 13, and it's a transparency framework for action and the support. So uh, the aim of this ETF is basically to build mutual trust between countries and promote the implementation of the Paris Agreement. So this ETF has further elaborated in Katowice into the modalities, uh, procedures and guidelines for transparency NPGs. So um, the Enhanced Transparency Framework actually uh, designed first and foremost to standardize reporting and monitor processes for all countries. The distinction between countries that are parts of Annex 1 and those that are not part of it is no longer uh, relevant under this framework. However, the ETF has been designed with built-in flexibility, which takes into account the different capacities of uh, countries and builds on the collective experience of transparency within the Convention. We have several policies and initiatives for both adaptation and mitigation. So you would see here in terms of our actions, we have the National Framework Strategy on Climate Change. We also have the Climate Change Act of 2009 and um, this was amended in 2012. We also have the National Climate Change Action Plan and also the National Climate Risk Management Framework. In terms of the greenhouse gas inventories and the mitigation actions, we have the Philippine Greenhouse Gas Management and Reporting System. We were also able to generate some information from the private sector in terms of their business climate actions for sustainability. So we also have some information of private sector actions on mitigation under that report. We also have the NDC Technical Working Group tasked to also come up with policies and measures to make sure that we are able to meet a 75% target, either both unconditional or conditional uh, targets for that.
So as you can see here, we have 10 policy assessment guides. Five of these cover GHG impacts and they're focused on different sectors. Then we have three which are on cross-cutting aspects. And then we have two process guides. Uh, we have the renewable energy guide. So this guide provides support on how to estimate um, emission pathways and reductions resulting from the implementation of policies in the energy sector. Then we have the transport pricing guide, which provides guidance on assessing the impacts of specific mitigation measures in the transport sector. Then we have the forestry guide, which provides guidance on assessing the impacts of forest policies. Then we have the agriculture guide, um, which supports the assessment of the impacts of agricultural policies and actions. And then finally, we have the building sufficiencies guide. The gu this guide covers policies for the residential sector. So those are our five guides that focus on GHD impacts. Then as you can see, we have these three um, that look at cross-cutting aspects. So these guides are really applicable to all sectors, policies and actions. So they're really, you know, those cross-cutting areas. So when we are implementing the policy, if we monitor what are the impacts on sustainable development, we can change things on the way, learn and improve in the new policies and actions that are produced. If you are looking at implementing the policy during or after the policy implementation, then you'll be looking at assessing the policy effectiveness. So this is a very useful action for adjusting the current policy design and to learn obviously from our, your experiences and most importantly to track progress towards our national goals such as the national determined contributions or the SDGs and understand the contribution of the policies to achieving these.